life is rough. A little rougher when the walkers are after you. Join us as we watch through The Walking Dead once more. And bring you all the heartache. Easter eggs, hidden details, and survival tips that we can find. Related Geek now brings you... Sunday of the Dead. Warning, Sunday of the Dead contains spoilers for The Walking Dead franchise. Hello, everybody! Hello! Hello. I am Marshall. I'm Lainey. I'm Corey. And today we're going to talk about season one, episode four of The Walking Dead, entitled Vatos. Mm -hmm. Now, a couple things that we are adding into our podcast, one of them is being viewership. And then later on, we're going to talk about maybe some deleted scenes, Mm -hmm. some other behind the things stuff. We'll be talking about that later. All right. So first off, let's talk about the viewership of this episode. Uh, Vatos originally aired on November 21st, 2010 in the U.S. on AMC. The episode attained 4.75 million viewers upon airing and garnered a 2.7 slash 4 HH rating. I'm not exactly familiar with the HH rating part of it. It received a 2.4 slash 6 rating in the 18 to 49 demographic, according to Nielsen's. Vatos became the highest rated cable program of the night and the ninth most watched cable program of the week. Wow, so it just dominated very quickly. Yeah, it's crazy because I thought it took longer for it to to kind of blow up. I know Breaking Bad did, but I heard that at one point, AMC was getting higher ratings than like cable sports. Right, Like exactly. higher ratings than ESPN, which that's pretty staggering. Mm. So you're saying that Killing Zombies became our national pastime? Yes. Awesome. I'm, I'm a fan of this. So in this episode, we flip between two different locations, the camp and Atlanta. And usually I will say, well, this is my favorite quote of the episode, but there are quite a few good quotes in this episode. So I will just be pointing them out as we go along the way. We start out at the camp of the survivors. Mm -hmm. Andrea and Amy are on a boat and they're fishing. And not five seconds into this episode, I ended up doing a very large deep dive into this canoe that they're sitting in. It took found... you like 10 minutes. Yes, I was researching for a very there long time. so much stuff just on the name of this canoe. I just right. love that you're in a quarry and you're doing a deep dive on a canoe. Yes, right? Mm. So the name on the boat says We Know Nah. This is the name of a company that was started by Mike Chikanowski. And his little blurb says he was born to paddle. He grew up on the banks of the Mississippi River where he cultivated a love for the water and insatiable curiosity to explore it. So then there is the legend of Princess Winona, who was a native Dakota woman and was a favorite in her tribe and in the city of Kiaksa, I think that's how you say it, which is now known as Winona. In the Dakota language, the word we know na means firstborn daughter, so it was very important that she married the ideal man. Her story is the legend of her futile leap from a precipice now called Maiden Rock to escape betrothal to the young chief Tamdaka when she desired the Frenchman Duluth. There is a statue in her honor in Winona, Minnesota. Hmm. And so, that's kind of funny because Winona Judd is the older sister. In the Judd family. Right. She's the firstborn daughter in the Judds. But also, more than likely, this boat belonged to Dale and his wife Irma, who, as far as I know, never actually had children. We might have to talk about that later because I've been tracking the canoe and there is a canoe on the top of the RV when they leave the survivor camp in the next episode. And it is not the same canoe. So maybe they owned two and they left one there. I don't know, but it's not the same canoe. So now we're going to talk about the conversation they're having, which I think is very interesting because they're talking about their dad and how their dad used to treat them differently, teach them differently. Mm -hmm. We find out that they are 12 years apart in age. And one of the things that Amy says is that their dad knew that... Andrea needed to catch the fish, and Amy needed to throw them back. Mm -hmm. So what do you guys think about that whole situation where their father used different techniques when teaching them how to fish? I I really liked this bit because it showed a father who understood major differences in his daughters and what they 
emotionally could handle, but also what they emotionally needed in order to feel confident in themselves. In that Andrea needed successes, but Amy needed to show mercy. Hmm. Which is going to be interesting as we get d- deeper into this episode when it comes to Amy. Correct. Yes. Yes. And there is also the quote, no crying in the boat, it scares the fish. And then Andrea later on says that she thought that that rule was more for their father and not the fish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like... Makes uh, sense. He, he couldn't handle it. Like, he's such an emotional person, probably, that right. he couldn't handle his daughter's crying in the boat, so... Well, even the strongest male on the surface, which still has its weak points. Yeah. So. Mm-hmm. One of the things that I noticed is that uh, Amy is sitting there and she's like, I wonder how mom and dad are. They, they're they down in Florida. And, you know, we just dealt with a major outbreak of a virus mm-hmm. and it kind of took over very quickly. So I looked through the spread rates based off of some of the CDC data, both in Georgia and in Florida. And even though Florida kind of had this is bad right now comparatively Mm -hmm. they grew almost in lockstep with each other with florida being just like two days ahead well that's a lot of because georgia is such close proximity to florida Mm -hmm. on top of the fact that sometimes i've heard people say that georgia and florida might as well be the same area because there's a lot of like traveling back and forth to the two states together and you know a lot of people from georgia moved to florida and vice versa so there is that probably why it's so close and further map data for these outbreaks show that the further south you go the more the infection rate spreads but when i looked at orlando versus atlanta they were about the same so Mm. their parents are probably in the exact same boat Ha ha, as they are right now. Gotcha. Also in this shot, there is a just gorgeous, as it's panning out, shot of the quarry water, Mm -hmm. which I I just thought it was was so beautiful. And then there's a part of me that would love to jump in that. Mm -hmm. But there's another part of me that's like, what is down there? It's such a beautiful blue. Yeah, that's what you get when you have the director of like Shawshank and Green Mm -hmm. Mile directing TV. So as we're closing on the scene, Dale is on top of his RV and he sees Jim digging a hole. Then we go to Atlanta and we're on the rooftop and we see Merle's hand has been sawn off. Mm -hmm. Sawed off? Sawed off. So then Rick and Daryl start to get into it. Daryl's blaming Rick. Rick's like, no... You need to calm it down. I made a note. It's really funny to see that later they call each other brothers and this is their beginning. Mm -hmm. They came from a very traumatic beginning and that's what they grew into. You you nearly killed my brother and now you're my brother. Yeah. During this this period, I was the way Daryl was acting. I I wrote down Feral (laughs) Daryl. Yeah. Also, what happens in this is that, you know, there's this whole moment where Daryl gets Merle's hand, wraps it up in a bandana, and puts it in Glenn's backpack. Glenn doesn't really object to this, but I've noticed he's just kind of like, <sighs> he's like, it's in my do you, bag. Do you have to? Yeah. But seriously, what is up with everyone shoving things in Glenn's backpack? Rick did it with the gun in no, second episode. No, it was episode. in the second episode. Yeah, he just shoves the gun in Glenn's No one's asking. They're just shoving things in his bag. Like, seriously, have you ever had someone do that to you? Isn't it just annoying? Yeah, it's actually really kind of a power move in a way. It's like a dominance move. You know, I'm not justifying that behavior, but Glenn has set himself up as the gopher in that way. So I think they kind of take advantage of that a little bit. There. Mm-hmm. One s- very small survival note. If you are in an apocalyptic scenario, each person does need to have their own backpack and their own carrying capacity with their own survival supplies. Right, yeah. Uh, I mean, I water, get it yeah. because Daryl's backpack is his quiver. It's mm-hmm. for his crossbow. So I get that he doesn't have his own carrying capacity. He's carrying yeah. the weapon. But yes, you're right. Everyone should have some kind of bag of yeah. holding. Uh, the other thing that is happening on this is that you can see visibly that T-Dog is still having pains in his side. And that's very interesting to me because I I applaud the actor who made that choice to still be hurt, 
even though that's way from episode two, mm-hmm. we're now in four. Yeah, he's still hurt. You, he goes, he kind of winces a little, holds his side. He's picking up Dale's tools from the roof. And yeah, I was like, great, great way to be in your character there. Yeah, right? yeah. Exactly. as opposed to like that cartoon logic where two seconds later, they're, they're not mm-hmm. paying it. Because this is like the next day. Mm-hmm. So yeah, of course, if he got that badly beat down by Merle, yeah, he, exactly. he's going to still be hurting. Mm-hmm. We do see that the walkers are no longer in the stairwell, which we saw that before when Merle was yelling up on the roof, the walkers were in the stairwell. They're no longer there. This is a part where it kind of jumps really quickly and not a lot happens between the camp and Atlanta. Guess what? Jim is digging. Dale goes to talk to him. We go back to Atlanta. They're clearing the building and looking for Merle. And then we're back at the camp. So Andrea and Amy come back with the fish to the camp Everyone is really, really happy about fish. And Amy does this little dance that is so adorable mm. where she's just kind of like, yay, I got the fish. Yay. It is, it's, it's so cute. I think it was very showing that they should find the joy in the small things. You know, they, what they were able to contribute in that small way was to go out, get these fish. And now it like had an impact in the greater group. Mm-hmm. It, it's very important for humans in, in their brains to have successes Mm -hmm. to the point that if you go for a long enough period of time without having found something that you go, I did this, you you start to fall apart. Mm -hmm. And that's what they found in the colony show on discovery channel was that these people were like, well, I have to have these daily things that I do so that I can, I don't get depressed. Yeah, it's a thing about retirement, too, that happens mm-hmm. to people where they just sit on their couch or, or their chair watching TV. They don't find a hobby. They don't find something to. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a there's a balance with that. Like, the feeling of always having to be productive on one extreme and the feeling of, you know, just being a couch potato on the other. But to find balance in that is kind of like what, what has to happen. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And then, of course, Dale goes and tells everybody, hey, guys, Jim is digging and now we're back in atlanta they are still looking for merle through this entire building they find a kitchen with like a sterno type flame some kind of bunsen burner i couldn't really figure yeah, out yeah that what looked it was. like he had taken a sterno and put it on top of a, a gas burner mm-hmm. so he was just using it to hold it really oh gotcha yeah. and he used it to cauterize his wound so i, I kind of wanted to talk about stereotypes in this show very briefly how people are never how they seem even when they are racist jerks, they can still be smart or even street smart. Cauterizing my wound is not the first thing that I would think of, but it is a smart choice, even mm-hmm. though it probably hurts a lot. It is a smart choice for the situation that you're in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So how do you think about the fact that this show takes stereotypes and kind of flips them on their head. The only way someone like you would have even thought to have seen that is if you'd watched Rambo. Mm-hmm. In, in that one, he used, like, gunpowder to, to do it. This is a show and, and a book that is written for the long haul. Mm-hmm. So it's going deep dives on characters. So it goes past that surface, goes past that stereotype, and, and gets into it. But it also, there's a reality. And deeper you get into... Daryl and Merle's backstory, which you do get in these, I think it's only one episode. There's always more to anybody's story than you see in your first encounter with them. Well, yes, but you don't have to write that. That's what I'm saying. No, absolutely. Yeah. It's very easy to write a stereotype character, but a good writer can go a little deeper and give an extra dimension and it just makes the character more memorable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's definitely a TV trope to go, okay... This is the Chandler. This is the Ross. Mm -hmm. This is how they're always going to respond. It's like a tennis match or a ping pong game. And it's just bouncing off of those characters and they respond in type. As opposed to making them 360 degree real people. So then they decide to go after Merle who they think has climbed out the window. um, Gone onto the streets. And there's this whole discussion about whether they're going to follow him or what. And T-Dog has this great quote, which is, I'm not strolling the streets of Atlanta with just my good intentions. (laughs) I think it's great. T-Dog is really like, 
I think that's an unsung hero, unsung character in this series that you don't really appreciate because he's not out there in your face, you know? Yeah, but what what I do remember, because we haven't gotten to this point yet, but when he leaves the show, we all felt horrible. And then another character came in and we're like, okay, cool. We have a new T-Dog. It's all right. Yeah. Right, like yeah. to deal with that, that should have gone on my wisdom from the moral center kind mm-hmm. of thing. Quote, that quote is really good for that. But also like what Marshall's alluding to is this is just show set in the South. The comic was originally written by a Southern white Southern man, but there are these favorite African-American characters that come in but T Dog is one of those first ones that you really get to appreciate. So Well, T Dog doesn't even appear in the comic. Yeah. Which is interesting to me. There is the other character that does show up in the comic that also shows up much later in the show, and that's Tyrese. And so that mm-hmm. makes me think that maybe T Dog was like the beginning Tyrese, and then they got Tyrese. Yeah. <laughs> to come in. I think when you have a second chance at a story like Kirkman did with the with the show you're like, well, maybe I don't need to resolve this yet. Maybe I can like make it even a slower burn mm-hmm. than, the, than the comic was. And that definitely happens in one of these episodes that we're going to talk about soon. Now we're back at the camp. The group as a whole with Carl and Sophia, which is very, like, I don't know, not maybe a good idea. They all confront Jim while he's digging. And Lori basically says that the group is getting scared of his digging. And so I was kind of like, why? I mean, I don't get it. Like, why don't they just let him dig if that's what he wants to do? What Give him he, some water and let him dig. What's what going on? What if he's on? digging their graves? What if he's planning to kill everybody? The other thing that I do want to bring up is that Lori goes, you're scaring the children that I brought to show them. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. That would have been my response as Jim is like, well, then why are you bringing them here? It's not even that. It's the fact that she's deflecting. Mm -hmm. He's scaring Lori and Lori's putting it off. Right. Exactly. So I actually feel like, yeah, it is something to be concerned about. Seeing somebody suddenly out there digging. When you go out there and you look, they are mm, graves. These are obviously graves. And he's not talking when you ask him what they are. Yeah, so you have two options. Either this guy has lost his mind, or this guy has some prophetic nature to him, and he sees something bad coming, and he is just that obsessed with getting things ready for it. You should be worried. Mm -hmm. No matter what. Somebody's digging graves. Be worried. Especially when they are that obsessed with it. I mean, yes, we have an RV, and yes, we have some woods, but what if he's just building poop holes? You know what I mean? like Digging a trench, sure. But at that point, if he's digging a trench with that much fervor mm. that he won't talk to you, there's still something wrong. I mean, I get <laughs> I get it. Like, later on, it is explained what he's doing and why. But I don't think my first response would be, like, you're scaring us, dude. I think my first response would be probably what they did. Hey, Jim, you need some water. Hey, Jim, what you doing? Can I help you? There's There's what it is. The first response should be like, hey, what are you doing? Could I help you? Do you need water? Do I need to get another shovel? Because when you start to go alongside somebody who is, you know, not doing things mentally stable, Mm -hmm. now you're on their side. Right. And they'll be more willing to give you confidence. I Mm -hmm. think it's also a first instance that we see of how important mental health Mm -hmm. is in this time as crazy as it, you just don't think about that as your first thing. Survival is obviously your first thing being the physicality of survival, but we will see with many of the characters as we go through the series that they wax and wane in their mental health. The actor, Andrew Rothenberg that plays Jim, just want to give a shout out to him. He does an amazing job all throughout his time in the series, but definitely in this episode, he's killing it. I think this is also one of the first points where I actively start not liking Lori. She Mm -hmm. really exposes her manipulation. It's very subtle. And she, she doesn't mean it to be manipulative. She has her own beliefs and her own morals. And at her heart, she thinks she's protecting her family. But really, she's a little bit manipulative. But she's also... Not as strong 
as mm-hmm. she could be. And the way that people talk about her, like she's this great, strong woman, no. she's really no. not. Carol is a strong woman. You know, Andrea, yeah, Andrea has gets a to be a strong yeah. woman, but she's got those beginnings. Lori is one of those characters that that is like a... I don't know if this is the right way to be saying it, but she's like the beta female in that she goes to the strongest male of the group and becomes their mate so that she's provided for without actually doing too much. Ooh, good call. Good call. That is what I have felt about her since episode one, which is also why I disliked her from the very first few lines that Rick has said, you're not here for this family. Mm -hmm. He's a deputy Mm -hmm. sheriff. He has responsibilities and you knew that. Yeah. If you couldn't handle that, why did you marry him? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. At this point, she's definitely not ready for the environment that she's in. Yeah. No. She proves no. it time and time again. She proves it in the comics that we'll talk about, and she, she proves it in the show. And now we're back in Atlanta, and Glenn has a plan to get the guns from the street. He is going to go with Daryl down an alley, and he's going to get the guns, and then he wants T-Dog and Rick to be at another alley a couple blocks down so that if something happens and he can't get back to Daryl, he can continue moving forward and go to where they are and he's protected either way. I love that there is a chalkboard on the wall, (laughs) but Glenn chooses to write in either dry erase, wet erase marker, or Sharpie on the floor and then proceeds to use office supplies to make his plan. He uses an eraser, a post-it flag pack, a piece of crumpled paper, and a binder clip. But not the chalkboard on the wall. No. <laughs> That's Maybe hysterical. there was no chalk. The, and there could have not been. No. Yeah. I didn't I wasn't able to look closely enough to see if there actually was chalk in there, but we also find out at this point that Glenn was a pizza delivery boy, which is how he can probably bust around so quickly yeah find mm-hmm. different routes alternate mm-hmm. routes that's definitely important. he already had rule number one down before this all happened cardio cardio yes well i don't think he was delivering pizzas on foot no but he probably had to run from the car to the mm. all right this next section guys i'm gonna take you on a deep dive of the street that glenn is running down i got a lot of information on this and i know it seems like really that's random but here we go So the first thing I would like to point out is they do use waste management trash cans, which we are also familiar with here in Florida. We do use waste management trash cans. So that was interesting. So the first store that he runs past once he gets out of the alley is a State Farm Insurance, which on the window says, Se habla espanol, which is fitting for this episode being named Fatos. The next store is a dry cleaners where you can get eight pieces of clothing cleaned for $17.99. Marshall and I both, when we first saw the store, thought it was a fried chicken restaurant. What else we found, and we're going to be coming back to all the things that are going on, is that we did find this corner exists. Yes, this corner, this upcoming corner still exists. So when Glenn does this belly flop dive into these sandbags, to get to the area where the guns are in the street. Also, while this is happening, this young kid approaches Daryl, but we'll come back to that. So here's what happens when Glenn goes onto the street on the corner. What he does is he grabs the guns and then stops, comes back and grabs Rick's hat, which Mm -hmm. is hysterical. And he's doing this on the corner of Forsyth and Walton. And the sign says the pipe corner. So here's a little bit of information about this corner, which probably is the most fascinating thing in this episode to me. Like I, this deep dive took me like 30 minutes. It was great. Because I saw this sign and I'm like, wait a minute. Does that sign exist somewhere? So this is the kind of the history of this building. The basement of the store had its own shadowy history in the 1920s. It served as a site for cockfights and the occasional boxing match with black fighters, including a 1926 middleweight champion named Tiger Flowers. The store owner, Joyce White, says that when she finally moved the business out, plenty of chicken feathers were found underneath boxes in, quote unquote, the pit. 
So this building was updated in 1936 to the Art Deco style, which I love the Art Deco style. It's so amazing. So upstairs, the Chagar store established itself as the first place to go for serious pipe smokers and over the next seven decades attracted a clientele that reads like a who's who of Atlanta power movers and personalities. The cool looking sign was placed by the Royal Cigar Company. Apparently the pipe store closed in the early 1990s, When working, the neon tubes represented smoke rings rising from the end of the pipe. So now let's also bring this up that this show was recorded in 2010, correct? Mm -hmm. So in 2014, which had been four years after this season, the building was placed on the Atlanta Preservation Center's list of most endangered historic places in Atlanta. In October of 2015, it was announced that a nearby tech building had plans to demolish the building and repurpose the area. However, following public outcry, the developers instead announced plans to preserve the building and build an expansion on top of the existing structure. As of 2018, no further plans have been announced for this building. So this is fascinating. This is an ongoing thing that there's this whole outcry of like, People who are like, no, keep it. And there's a part of me that wonders if it's because of the show. Possibly. Well, yeah, it could be like they could use it for tourism. I'm sure they do Walking Dead tours. Oh, yeah. Mm hmm. So at this point, Miguel, he is the little kid that approached Daryl. His friends show up and start beating on Daryl, and then Rick and T Dog come running. One of the guys says, that's the bag, Vato, take it. So that's where we get Vato. And we're going to hear that a lot during this episode. For those of you who didn't take Spanish in school, the Spanish slang for man. Mm-hmm. Daryl shoots one of them in the butt. Go, Daryl. Now, I, I want to bring up that even though this is a big conflict situation, it's very, very tense, he still is going for non-lethal shots yes, he against is. human opponents. So he, he doesn't hesitate at all to kill when it's necessary, but... If he doesn't know what's going on, he has the presence of mind to just shoot somebody in the butt. I think that's excellent. You gotta take it to the character, okay? So let's say Big Brother, Merle. I would not doubt that Merle has been in trouble with the law at some point. I don't think it's a stretch to say that. So Baby Brother, you know, Daryl would be looking to say, there's self-defense here, but I'm not gonna go to the point of killing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the Vatos take Glenn while Daryl, Rick, and T-Dog take Miguel and the thing of guns. Rick is reunited with his hat. And at this point, I want to ask as a group, can we consider the hat to be an honorary season one OG Walking Dead character? Yes. Absolutely. It should have its own Instagram. And in a way, you could almost look at the hat. I feel like the hat is a marker of who is the main character at that point in time like for a good long time it is rick who is our main character Mm -hmm. but then we are spending a lot more time watching emotionally from carl's perspective he is the emotional right like viewpoint and now in more recent seasons it's judith Mm -hmm. and she's got the hat so the hat is the person to watch Mm -hmm. it's a western trope that's the thing we have to take into this like the, Mm -hmm. the he's the sheriff in the western Trope, and so that's why it is that way. And I know that I've heard that this last season that we watched was just 10. Mm -hmm. It was really a Western bent on the whole. So I think we can definitely say that there are actually three original characters still left on Walking Dead. Daryl, Carol, and and Rick's hat. Mm -hmm. (laughs) At this point, Rick says, let's get back to the lab. And I have to ask, what lab? (laughs) Yeah. What what is this lab that they're in? Because the place that they're doing things, like we've seen a kitchen there, we've seen a boardroom. Yeah. Was that a continuity error when they were thinking about the CDC or something? I actually went back and looked at all the places they were in and I couldn't figure out. It has a store in the bottom. Yeah. I mean, maybe there's a lot of things that are included in this building, but even the room they go back to to talk about the guns is not a lab. It's It's, another office. Maybe it's just the expression. Yeah. Back to the Maybe. Line. I don't really like, know back what to the that one is. Board or... All right. So instead, let's go back to the camp. They've tied Jim to a tree. He agrees he should probably be tied to a tree because he's just like, yep, I'm here. Uh, I'm, no, I'm, off, no I'm off my rocker. It's okay. <laughs> Carol and Lori are doing lessons with Sophia and Carl. And if you look in the background, Morales is picking up large rocks. And at the point, I was like, why is he picking up large rocks? We explain later. 
Yes. But I want to bring up, hey, Lori, you're like, hey, this guy is scaring the kids. And then when the guy is tied up, you go and have your kids have lessons next to the guy. Yep. That's not the only thing Lori does in the scene that I'm questioning. Are you ready for this one? So first off, let's talk about the fact that Jim says he had a dream he quote unquote, didn't remember, but Carl and Rick were in it. Mm -hmm. I don't buy this. Okay, I don't buy the storyline that he doesn't really remember what his dream was about, but he's out there digging holes for it. I don't I don't get that. Okay, I'm willing to bet that it's a lot more along the lines of he doesn't remember everything, but he remembers certain things that he doesn't want to tell anybody because it'll scare them worse than he's digging Especially holes. Especially with the kids around. Right, yeah. yeah. So then Shane comes to take the kids to clean the fish. I'm sorry, I thought Shane was supposed to stay away from Carl. That's why she says Carol go with them. Right. But Which, still. Yes. <laughs> yes. I think there's another part in this episode as well where I'm just like, what? Lori. Like, she's just not... She's not being consistent. And then after the kids leave, Jim says to Lori to keep Carl close. Again, an indication that he remembers more about this dream than he's really letting on. But good thing for Lori's actress, she plays that through. Like she gets, she hears it and she's like, oh, what the heck are you? Oh, you do remember your dream. You could see that in her eyes. And mm-hmm. she realizes that something bad is probably going to happen. And yet, she does nothing to stop it. Mm-hmm. Let's go back to Atlanta. Okay. Why All right. Not? Yeah. So they're interrogating Miguel. He has a cannabis tattoo on his neck, as one does when you're like 14. I don't know how old he is, but <laughs> whatever. Uh, so Daryl does this really great move where he's trying to attack Miguel. He grabs Rick's like shoulders and neck and does this like flying leap kick trying Mm -hmm. to kick Miguel in the head. It's fantastic. Yeah. You go back and watch it. He's just like very acrobatic and like tries to swing up into it. It, It's great. It is great. So then he tries to frighten him by throwing Merle's hand into his lap. And he says that he says like, this is what happened to the last guy who made me mad. Maybe I'll start with the feet this time. Mm -hmm. Again, we have a feet cutter offer homicide. Maybe this is a crossover with Superstore. Maybe. Because, you know, they find the feet that are severed all over their store. So he goes all the way out to St. Louis area. Nobody knows what Daryl does when they sleep. (laughs) Yeah. But it's again, it's also another instance of Feral Daryl. Yes. Right. So then they go to the location that the Vatos are. And Miguel reveals that the main man is Guillermo. So Guillermo, the actor, I knew I had seen him somewhere before, but I couldn't remember where. So I found he was in Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency, a short-lived series on BBC America. And he was uh, he played DJ Yella and Straight out of Compton. The other guys that were there is Felipe, who is the guy who gets shot in the butt. And Jorge is the other guy. So they start to negotiate with Guillermo about who had, who gets the guns Who gets Miguel? Who gets Glenn? But there's kind of a standoff. I do want to talk once more about this location. So this part was filmed at the Goat Farm Art Center in West Midtown, Atlanta. Mm -hmm. It has a really interesting history, which I'm going to share with you now. It was built during the 1880s. And in 1898, the site specialized in cotton-related machinery and won awards at international expositions and state fairs. In 1912, the Murray Company of Texas bought out Van Winkle and the site became known as Murray's Mill. During World War II, the complex produced ammunition and mortars. In the early 1970s, Robert Hayward bought the site and sculptors, painters, musicians, and photographers set up studios there. For a time in the early 2000s, space was rented to the antique dealers as the shops at Murray Mill, but the antique mall never took off. The site remained unused for many years. In 2009, that would be the year before this episode happens, Hallister made the decision to develop the site into a center for the visual and performing arts, containing performance and exhibition halls, a cafe library, an on-site organic farm, an education center, a 5,000 square foot space dedicated to contemporary dance, and a creative studios for artists. And in 2012, it was used for... The Hunger Games, Catching Fire. Wow. I thought that was so interesting. And I think there are spots you can see. For example, the organic farm area. I think you kind of walk through it a little bit in one of the scenes where 
where they take them into the old folks residence. Mm-hmm. But it, it's just such a beautiful site. The way it's all brick with all of the arches and everything is just so pretty. It's got great architecture. And they kind of tried to play it up as being run down Mm -hmm. by putting these plants all over the place and putting graffiti all over the place. Although all the graffiti was probably by the same guy. Right. (laughs) Because they all have uh, areba as the the word that's being written on them. So they make a plan to do the exchange and to decide to return Miguel once they've gotten back to quote unquote the lab. Daryl is not liking the fact that they're giving the guns. Rick said, well, you know, are we, you know, really going to give the guns? I didn't say we were. But this is the best quote, I think, is when they're talking about Glenn and whether they want to do the exchange to get Glenn back. And Rick says, what life I have, I owe to him. I was nobody to Glenn, just some idiot stuck in a tank. He could have walked away, but he didn't. Neither will I. Again, I've said it before. Glenn is legitimately one of my favorite characters on this show. Hands down. I, I just, uh, I, I, I don't, <laughs> I can't even finish a sentence. She's speechless. <laughs> no, he's great. That actor is really great. Marshall and I just got finished watching season one of Invincible, and he's the star of that. Another Robert Kirkman comic. He's really good at getting you to really feel for him without seemingly a lot of effort. Interestingly enough, the actor has a history in improv comedy. Oh, so now we're going to go back to the compound. And they are kind of at this whole, you know, standoff where all the sides have guns. And then Felipe's grandmother shows up. Grandma's like, no, don't take him. Don't take him. And they're like, we're not going to take him. We just want our guy. And, and she's like, oh, yeah, I know that guy. He's over helping this other guy who's having health issues. So Grandma takes Rick to see Glenn, and they see a whole other part of the compound where there's this old folks medical facility. T-Dog says he thought Glenn was being eaten by dogs because there was this whole thing like, we're going to feed Glenn to the dogs. And they turned out to be these little saying. chihuahuas <laughs> in the basket. They were so funny. So I, I like that there are these small little comedic moments in this, like, really serious scene, you know? Yeah, but, like, what was Rick's actual plan here? Like, because he's going in, he's like, I'm not going to give him the guns. I never said I'm going to give him the guns. We're just going to shoot this out. Was he really just planning on calling Guillermo's bluff and saying, give us our guy? I'll give us Yeah, you. I think he was. That's some huevos. Right. Right. <laughs> it's also a police move, though. Oh, yeah, it totally is. So Guillermo says that the staff took off, and it's him and Felipe, I think, or... Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, Felipe, who is a nurse. So the questions I have about this is, number one, if you watch the scene again, you will see at least three people that are dressed as nurses helping other residents. They're mm-hmm. younger. They're dressed not in scrubs, but more in like a... Those like kind of softer nurses garbs mm-hmm. that you see. So why, if the nurses all took off and Philippe's the only one, are what are what are these? Are these like family members helping or something? Well, what I what I think he mentioned is that he talks about how the Vatos came. I'm assuming the way that he's saying this, it's not only just meaning men, but it's a gang mm-hmm. named the Vatos who have come back to see their grandparents and decided to stay. And it's entirely possible that not all of the Vatos were like, well, I'm going to keep on fixing up the cars and go on runs. Maybe I'm just going to dedicate myself to taking care of our grandparents. Well, if that's the case and the fact that they are Vatos, why did they send their only nurse, Felipe, on a run to get guns? Why didn't one of the other Vatos go? It's a good call. I think it's interesting, though, about what you were just saying, Marshall, about the them taking care of the grandparents that's definitely a cultural thing Mm -hmm. with uh the latin communities they definitely value Mm. value the older members of their family a lot more than other cultures do Mm -hmm. that's true and what we've seen like we watched a whole bunch of other shows obviously one of them was one called burn notice and one episode uh he's dealing with a gang a latin american gang that is taking over a neighborhood And he says, in any place where the police won't go, you will find that justice is done by gangs. Gangs will rise up and they will take care of their own. Mess with them, mess with their turf, they will mess with you. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're seeing here is that this gang came back to take care of their own people. Because humans are innately a social 
species. Mm-hmm. We we survive and we thrive better as a group. All right, so then we find out who G is in the grand scheme of things. He's the custodian. So I want to bring up two points about this. The first is the fact that he was a, just a custodian, but then look where he rose from being a custodian. And also that in the Walking Dead universe, everyone seems to get a name that starts with the, whether they're a person or a group. And we're going to start tracking that through the entire series. So this would be the first one, the custodian. Guillermo. Like you said, it won't be the first time we see somebody that had a job that's totally different than what they ended mm-hmm. up in. Uh, that'll come into play definitely much later. Yes. He also talks about the fact that the Vatos do work on the cars, even though he doesn't think they're going to be able to get the elderly people out. But that is it's good for them to have a purpose to work on these cars. And that's kind of a good point for the pandemic as well, that people need to have a purpose of some kind or else they feel like they're not really fulfilling their life. So I think, you know, to that point, if you haven't found your purpose, find your purpose. I can tell you this just from personal experience. Lainey has been finding hobbies like nonstop since the pandemic is it. She had actually been working as well nonstop but also finding things to occupy her non-work time to keep her mind going. True that. Rick gives them a few guns and they head back to the van, but the van is gone. So they think, oh, did Merle take the van? Also, Glenn says, Rick, admit it. You came back for the hat. Mm -hmm. It's hysterical. Let's go back to camp. This is kind of the major thing that happens at the end of this episode. So we're going to go through it with as much, I think, sensitivity as we can. So Andrea is looking for wrapping paper in the RV for a mermaid necklace she's going to give for Amy's birthday, which is the next day. At this point, also Morales reveals that he's using the rocks to hide the campfire flames by building them up higher around the fire area, which now it's explained. So that's kind of an interesting connection to me that you see this thing that's happening in the background, but then you're like, why? It pays off later, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, and so now they can build the fire higher and be warmer. That's a good thought. Mm -hmm. Because the rocks will maintain the heat as well. Right, exactly. So then Shane comes back from Skin and the Fish with Carl, and they're by themselves. Mm -hmm. There's no Sophia, there's no Carol. Seriously? Then later on, Sophia brings a bowl of something to Ed, and Ed wants Sophia to stay and keep her daddy company. Yeah. I have a very bad feeling about that. Just that sentence Mm -hmm. i don't even know if we can discuss it i don't i don't know if we should discuss it but no i i think (sighs) i think there's enough odious coming out of this guy that we don't need to delve into it right but now that carol has been empowered by her husband's savage beating she feels strong enough to go like no she doesn't want to stay with you. Cool. Mm-hmm. We're leaving. Right. I mean, what's he going to do? Get up out of bed and like chase them? No. <laughs> he can't no more. <laughs> <laughs> Daryl, Glenn, and T-Dog, they are running to the camp, right? Because they don't have the van. So they're like, we're going to run. They also are afraid that Merle has taken the van to come and get revenge exactly. on the camp. Exactly. So now we're at the fish fry. And here's some things that happen in like... Rapid succession. The first thing I would like to touch on is that when Jim is taking the fish from the pan to put on his plate, he pauses and then he puts it on his plate. And it made me wonder, is he starting to get deja vu? Yes. This is the point where he goes, oh no, this is where it starts. I've never noticed that before, but when I saw that moment, I went, oh, that's just masterful <laughs> yeah this is something i totally forgotten about the beginning of this yeah. about the series is like these smaller characters that aren't the primaries and their stories is something i just don't remember because i've only watched it through once before so yeah next up you're gonna see that dale's watch they're gonna we're gonna have a whole discussion about time and dale's speech about time in just a second but i wanted to point out that his watch is set at six ten. That's what time they're eating. And it's pretty dark for 610. In the comics at this point, it is winter. It's yeah. snowing. But for the show, like, you can tell in the next episode, Rick is visibly sweating. So that well, leads me to believe it's not quite, like, winter. Well, when it, would it be, like, when is the, we, it's September, right? we switch right? back, it's going to be in September. So that would make sense. If you were still September and the time shift would happen, but not necessarily the heat change. It's probably still really hot in September. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So this is where we have Dale's speech. Oh, this is a 
a uh, father giving his watch to his son is what precedes this. And it says, I give you the mausoleum of all hope and desire, which will fit your individual needs no better than it did mine or my father's before me. I give it to you not that you remember time, but that you may forget it for a moment now and then and not spend all of your breath trying to conquer it. So this is very important, this speech, because in the fifth season of Walking Dead, the final five episodes are called Remember, Forget, Spend, Trying, and Conquer. And they all derive from the titles that Dale's speech is saying when he talks about the father who gives the son a watch. So that's really interesting that they take it to all the way to the fifth season and really give that homage to Dale. That's mm-hmm. really awesome. I yeah. Mean, yeah. Uh, there's, of course, a lot of appreciative, like, yes, ah, oh, yeah, good points. And there are some weighted looks along the campfire, too. Like, Shane and Lori are kind of, like, giving each other some weird, like, dramatic glances. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know how to describe it, but it's really like, all right, guys, <laughs> calm so, it down. So should we talk about, like, the... The kind of the meaning behind the quote, the meaning in general and the meaning within this story. Mm -hmm, Sure. Conquering time, that sounds very, to me, sounds very American. It's a very, you are only worth what you can produce. So you have to like, time is money. It's all of that kind of thing. Where what it seems the father is telling the son is take time sometimes to not just be so rushed and hurried and producing because we are so stressed out about can i fit everything in my day basically that's what our lives have become even now and he's saying i'm gonna give you this watch so that you don't have to be thinking about the time all the time you've got it strapped to your wrist Mm -hmm. and it is an older quote i can't remember he said he's faulkner i think is is who he said it was yeah so faulkner was like 20th century so he hadn't even ever seen an iphone or anything like Mm -hmm. that so We can't say it's a modern quote at all. So for for them, it's interesting because they don't have a lot of time for leisure in their pandemic. So I guess the moments that they can take to reflect are shorter, but still important. And at this point, Amy says she has to go to the bathroom in the RV. As she's coming out the door, I noticed that the side of the RV actually says day and Irma Horvath, which is Dale's L has rubbed off on the mm-hmm. side. But I gotta, I gotta ask, why would you put your entire name on your RV? I, I would not do that. It's an older generation thing, though, because right. the perspective we're coming from is a post-9-11 security-based thing. He's of a different generation. If you think about KOA camps where you would park one of those things... It's a friendlier situation, more right. social. Good like, Sam. That was the sticker on their RV. Is yeah. The Good Sam, yeah. KOA and Good Sam are equivalent type. It's like campgrounds. having your name on your mailbox. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So Amy comes out and she is bitten by a walker on the arm as well as the neck. Now, from what I can find online, Greg Nicotero is actually the walker that bites her. Wow. Even though she, he is also the special effects artist who created the effect of the splurting blood out of her neck. I think, and I tried to look because I see, I know what he looks like because I've seen him on Talking Dead. I am pretty sure that's him. Mm-hmm. That so sense. that's kind of a cool thing. They said they wanted to treat Amy's death with more of a consideration because she was such a special character and she wasn't with them for very long. So that's kind of why he wanted to do it himself. Which is cool. Yeah, her character actually gets echoed in the future uh, later. In fact, this next season will come up with mm-hmm. the next echo of her kind of beloved yeah. female character. But mm-hmm. I want to know, how did that walker even sneak up on her? You have all these people that are in very close proximity to the RV. You can see that RV from where they are. Mm-hmm. Nobody noticed. Even Lori, who has just been warned keep Carl close. She's not... She's not facing the RV, though. She isn't facing But Shane the, is, and yeah. I don't know how he didn't see Nobody it. is watching. They're just so busy eating, and they just came off of a quote-unquote scary experience with a dude digging holes. Technically speaking, from a security standard, there should have been somebody on watch, mm-hmm. but it doesn't appear that, they, that there was anybody, so that is a fail. I can feel a little bit for Amy in the sense that imagine that you have, really have to go to the bathroom. Sounds a little gross, 
but your thoughts are not on your surrounding. It's literally, an, it could be in an intense situation and wherever the pertinent bodily function is could mm-hmm. distract you to that point where you're not on the lookout. Right. I don't blame Amy for being snuck up on. I blame everybody else for not paying attention. Yeah, but yeah. I the real the real point is they should have had somebody on point. Yeah, not necessarily Correct. everybody around the fire should have been the one to see it. There should have been somebody on top of the RV or something like that. Mm-hmm. Really. Well. Also, at the same time that she's getting eight across camp, there's somebody who has stayed in his camp and being a whiny baby, and he gets eight. This Ed is why you should not isolate yourself from the rest of the camp. Mm-hmm. This is why humans are social animals. We protect each other. Maybe also he shouldn't unzip the door. You know, be like, who is it? And if you hear, ar, 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 just yeah. stay in the tent. Don't unzip. Yeah. I mean, yeah, they might scratch at you or whatever. But I think we've seen enough where the zombie is inside the tent, zipped inside, and can't get out. Yeah. So I want to say they can't get in either. So just stay in your tent. Well, I think it's also <laughs> interesting just that, that he was, you know, let's face it, he was a wife beater. That's what he did. It's interesting that those people, they assert strength over the people living in their homes, but they generally are weak kind of outside mm-hmm. of that. So that it does attest and prove that somebody that is like that probably isn't going to last long in the zombie apocalypse. It doesn't make them strong in any way, shape, or form. I just realized that it was a female walker who bit him. I did too, That's just now awesome. too. That's yes. So the That's the woman awesome. got the revenge. It'd be yes. funny if they actually did it up to Carol to do yes. it. Yes. <laughs> Rick and his group are like running, and they hear the screams. They're hearing gunshots of all of this chaos that's happening. And if you watch the four of them, they start moving like in sync with each other. They like get in this formation of like four people, and they're like scanning, very militaristic. It is amazing. These guys don't even know each other that well, and all of a sudden they're like, "And we're here." Let's do mm-hmm. this. You know, it's awesome. Squad goals. Squad goals, yes. Then Rick goes, we've got another instance of Coral! Coral, babe! Coral! And then Andrea's crying again. She has a reason this time. Mm-hmm. Let's give it to her. But Carl is also, and this is something that, like, I kind of forgot the first couple episodes. I mean, he's young. He, he doesn't know how to deal with what's going on. But I, I will say it again probably in the next episode, too, is that he has a very big heart. Very big heart. Mm-hmm. He loves people, like, almost on sight. So he's crying also because of Amy now, too, because Amy had such an impact on them as well. I just, I think I want to, like, track this. I want to track, like, when he starts to change from this this kid who just wears his heart on his sleeve all the time, you know? So then also, Jim, quote unquote, remembers his dream and why he dug the holes. Or at least he says he did. Now, one of the things that we do here in this episode, it was, it was said a little earlier, is that his family died because he was so scared for himself. Right that the only reason he survived is because they were eating his family. Right. So exactly. there's this this huge guilt on him there. I'm still running with this feeling like he actually has prophetic dreams. Oh, yeah. And so whatever happened, he he saw this going on and started running and realized the zombies are getting my family because I started running. Mm-hmm. And now he's in this and he's having this happen to him again right like this guilt is just overriding him yeah it's it's interesting because the rest of the show doesn't really have a lot of i mean supernatural take what you want about the nature of zombies but there really isn't a whole lot like what's going on in jim's dreams in this but you can also extrapolate like he would obviously be dreaming about his family having the ptsd of what he saw and how that could be extrapolated into a hypersensitivity about it happening again. It's kind of a yes and in my book, like the prophetic dreams. So one of the things I do want to bring up is something that Marshall and I talked about and then I found an answer, kind of. The the thing we really wished we knew more about was what happened to the Vatos group after Rick and his party left. And Marshall was like, well, I think 
you know, it'd be really cool if there was some kind of other episode about them or whatever. Other episodes, well, a spinoff series. Something like that. I did find a deleted scene that was supposed to be in there. It shows Rick and the crew visiting the Vatos, but finds everyone dead, including the old people. Another gang had overrun the Vatos, killed everyone inside, and stolen their food and supplies. I'm glad they didn't show that, because that's just a bummer. Yeah, that would, that would depress me, especially after the ending of this episode. Right. So uh, while we've come to the end of the scenes of this episode, let's talk a little bit about the extras. So as far as the music goes, there's just a lot of somber inter- instrumental music. I wasn't able to find it, what the names were, or anything of that. Just give a shout out to the actual guy that does the music. His name is Bear McCreary, and he will be doing Kevin Smith's Masters of the Universe as soon as it premieres. As far as who dies, we do have Amy, we have Ed, who is considered the first official death of the series, Mm -hmm. and at least three unnamed survivors that I could tell that were attacked and bitten by the walkers during the attack. Now, if you remember correctly, I said when we first started this, there are about 11-ish unnamed survivors at the camp. And now three of them are gone. Okay, so that means we have, what, like eight more? Mm -hmm. In theory. When we go to our next episode, episode five, I'm going to talk a little bit more about what happens to those eight unnamed survivors. So stay tuned for that. All right, let's talk about the comic connection in all of this. We're talking about still volume one. This is still chapter one of the graphic novel, pages 96 through 116. So here are some things that happen in the graphic novel. People are learning how to shoot. Rick and Shane are teaching everyone, well, everyone who wants to learn how to shoot, to shoot, including Carl. Lori is not happy about this. Now, this whole scene kind of takes place in season two and maybe three of the TV show. But in the comic, this is actually very significant at this point, which we will get into. So I like that before, it's starting to snow, it's winter time. And we also find out that Dale was a salesman for 40 years. They don't say of what, but he was. A couple other jobs that these people had, Amy was a junior physical education major at college. Andrea was a clerk at a law firm. And the best shot out of the ones that were getting trained. Oh yes. Glenn is still a pizza delivery boy. Carol sold Tupperware, kind of like as a side hustle, and Ed was a car salesman, I'm not surprised, and Jim is a mechanic. The way they played that off, amazing. They were literally around the fire. This couple that isn't part of, that we don't see in the in the TV show, she says, Glenn, Dale, and the girls had already set up the camp when we got here. Our car broke down, and we walked here. Piece of crap, never worked. And then it just shows us Jim, and he's like, mechanic. <laughs> I thought that was a really funny, like, little... Which little... means he should be able to help Dell get these cars in shape right. pretty quick. There is still a walker attack. Amy yeah. does get bit. All right, so here comes the big, big thing that happens in the comic at this point. So Lori is going to shoot a walker from the walker attack. She drops the gun. Then Carl picks it up and shoots the walker instead. Okay, so that was the what was so significant about teaching him how to shoot is that he was able to save Lori by shooting this walker. Also at this point, Jim does get bitten, which we will not find out about until the next episode in the TV show, but it happens here as well, like almost immediately you see it. Yeah, and I, I do feel like Carl getting the gun and Lori dropping the gun does say a lot about their characters. She is not able to handle what's going on. Yeah, it's that in your face to the Lori situation. And that is it for episode four, Vatos. Next week, we're going to be talking about season one, episode five, Wildfire. Thank you for listening to Sunday of the Dead and exploring each episode with us. If you have any interesting facts or details about an upcoming episode, feel free to email us at share at elatedgeek.com. We want to bring you new and exciting geek-worthy content. If you want to help, please consider donating to our coffee account. The link is in the show notes, and every donation is accepted with total appreciation for your support. Follow us on social media for more of our geek obsessions. Find Lainey on at Zany Lainey or me at One True Hazard. For updates, keep an eye on Adelated Geek on Instagram or Adelated Geek Tweets on Twitter. Or go to our website at www.elatedgeek.com. Links for these are in the show notes. Until next time, geek out.